that was cool. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the North Sydney Local Planning Panel. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, past, present and future and emerging. And I um, would also like to indicate that um, this is a public meeting for the first two items that we have on the agenda today. That is for the matter of four Honda Road and the other uh, second matter, which is two, uh, 327 Pacific Highway, North Sydney. Uh, we have another two items on the agenda, which will be closed to the public, which is um, 232A Miller Street, North Sydney, and, um, and 372 Military Road, Cremorne. I would just like to uh, preface the meeting by saying that the panel members have all had the opportunity of reading the council reports, of reading the objections that were made to the, exhibit, the exhibited development applications, and we have also uh, read the submissions that have been made directly to the panel on all items. The panel is constituted with four of us today, and I'm going to ask each one to introduce themselves and indicate if they have any conflicts of interest. Uh, Jan Morell is my name, and I've been the chair of the uh, North Sydney Local Planning Panel since its inception, and uh, I am a retired commissioner from the Land and Environment Court, and since retirement, I, have, um, I work on local planning panels uh, as a chair or expert member. Uh, can I invite, and I do not have any conflicts of interest, can I invite Lloyd to introduce himself? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lloyd Graham. I have no uh, conflicts of interest. I have a background in town planning and urban research, with most of my work being in Western Australia, uh, in the state government planning department, and subsequently on the State Administrative Tribunal in WA. Since being in New South Wales, I've been on a number of local planning panels, and I currently um, operate my own planning consultancy uh, with work in metropolitan Sydney and rural New South Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Meredith? Uh, my name is Meredith Trevallon Jones. I have a, uh, an architectural background. I've been a resident of the local government area here in North Sydney for over 30 years and I'm involved in the local precinct system and I'm here as a community representative and I don't have any conflicts of interest in relation to this project. I think I believe you'll be sitting out on item four. Item four, yes, but not not this one. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Sorry. Well, this is in respect of all items. Oh, all items. Yes. Okay. Well, a perceived uh, conflict of interest in relation to item four, so I won't participate in in that one. Thank you. And Brendan. Uh, my name is Brendan Randalls. I'm an architect and urban designer, and I'm on uh, numerous uh, design review panels throughout Sydney. I've been a. Uh, I continue to. Uh, practice professionally, and I don't have any conflicts on any of these items. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have, I can see John Kenny and Morgan Kelly uh, on the screen. Do we have any other people that we require to um, admit to this meeting, Peter? We do, but a lot don't have the video on. Sorry? A lot of them don't have the video on. All right. All right. So we, I understand that there are a number of people who do not have their video on, but you can turn them on if, you, if, you, if you're capable of doing that in terms of having that technology. And, um, and that's way great. And then there'll be others that we probably just hear from. Very well, let's go to the first item, which is for Honda Road, Caraba Point. And this is the subdivision of the lot into two lots and the construction of a new dwelling and the alterations and additions of the existing dwelling and also includes stormwater works. I have uh, listed here, I note that there's been nine written submissions made to the panel and I, I understand um, and have read that there were 20 submissions when the matter was advertised. So can I can go to the first submitter. I have uh, John Kenny. Thank you, you're there. 
Um, I'll just go through the names and then I'll ask you to address the panel. Peter James. No. Uh, Mark and Maria Darian Smith. No. Morgan and Hannah Kelly. Yes, yes I'm here. Thank you. Good. Oh. And um, uh, Councillor Mary Ann Verigi. She'll be in the council meeting. Uh, Curtis and Shirley Davies. Uh, I'm aware that Curtis Davies couldn't be here today, unfortunately, because of a, a last minute work commitment. All oh, right. Okay. Unable to attend. Thank you for letting me know that. Uh, Bill, Bill Tullock. Bill Tullock, consultant. Yes, he is there. I can see he's there. Okay, I can't see him. Uh, yes, I think my video is not working there, but I can hear you, Commissioner. Oh, thank uh, and uh, Okay, chair. Jan, or Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> chair will be and good. and um, Sandy uh, XQ. Sandy's not there. Okay, then I will call those names again and give those people the opportunity of um, joining us. But, um, and I have Kerry Gordon, who is the consultant planner for representing the applicant. Thanks, Kerry. Yes. Okay, so first of all, could we hear from John Kenny? All right, well, thank you very much. And I think a lot that list that you just read out was a, a lot of people that provided uh, written submissions to this panel. Uh, weren't planning on attending, but thank you very much uh, for allowing me to attend, address the panel. Uh, my name's John Kenny and my wife and I own 3 Honda Road, which is directly opposite the proposed development at 4 Honda Road. Our home is listed as a heritage item on the North Sydney LEP and he's coming up on being 100 years of age. Honda Road has only four properties with this street address, two of which were influenced by the prominent architect William Hardy Wilson. The proposed development is within 100 metres of other significant heritage items, including Honda House, built by William Bennett, and directly opposite the beautiful Arden on Bogota Avenue that was built in 1893. Since 1912, this neighbourhood has been known as the Honda and Arden Estate. Emma and I want to make it clear that we're not anti-development in our 20-year ownership of the property. There have been many other alterations, additions, and developments of properties in this surrounding uh, prominent corner. All have been, have been sympathetic to the heritage conservation area, and this is the first proposal we've objected to. The proposed subdivision on this site, well, quite simply, it just destroys the entire premise of the Carava Point conservation area that specifically lists the current subdivision pattern of the Honda and Arden estates as being important to protect. The proposed subdivision does not allow, or does not follow the topography, but cynically steals land from one lot to meet the minimum lot size of the other lot. Panel members, we do hope that you've had the opportunity to inspect the site and realise that if this subdivision and proposed development proceeds, the impact will be irreparable on the conservation area. The proposal is not suitable for approval and the assessment report fails to adequately address many issues. In summary, the area shape and dimensions of the lots are just not suitable. The assessor's report confirms this, noting the narrower frontage than other sites in the vicinity. The subdivision and proposed development will destroy the heritage of the area. The assessor suggests the proposed dwellings will be visually submissive in comparison to the nearby heritage items. This is false and the complete opposite is true. The proposal will be an eyesore on the prominent corner in the conservation area. It's a focal point on the important Carava Point to Cremorne Point walk, enjoyed by tens of thousands of Sydney siders every year. We completely disagree with the assessment report that this impact is, access, is acceptable when viewed from the public domain. As noted in the assessment report, House 2 has several design features that are not characteristic to the conservation area, but somehow the assessor seems okay with this. We are simply not. The proposal does not have a comparable and complementary building form and scale to that which characterises the area. The proposal is over height and the ground floor will be subject to flooding. There is an unacceptable loss of the tree canopy. No traffic management plan has been submitted or considered and the street was recently on Channel 9 News as a result of a gridlock suburban street caused by development more than half a kilometre away. And finally, the community's concerns simply have not been satisfied by the proposed conditions. 
So panel members, please listen to the local community, please listen to our consultant, and please uh, protect this conservation area. We respectfully ask that the panel members reject this DA and the subdivision of this site. And I want to thank you very much for your time and listening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenny. Uh, if any of the panel members have a question of the presenters, please just indicate. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next speaker. Yes, I just. Did you have a question? Thank you, Lloyd Graham. Yes, um, I'm sure you're aware that under the R2 zone, a 450 square metre lot is permissible. So with what you've said, are you opposed to both the subdivision and the type of development? Or do you accept that the subdivision would be allowable at 450 and then you're opposed to the, the actual physical form of what's being suggested in terms of the residential structure? I think one follows the other, I think if your question, I think one follows the other. Uh, we we contest that the subdivision uh, is inappropriate and, and doesn't meet uh, the requirements. And I think our consultant, Bill Tullock, will speak to that in some detail. Um, if, however, for some reason we're uh, unsuccessful in that, we think the remaining proposal has significant uh, problems with it as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinney. Uh, Mr. P Peter James, you're not here. Are you here? Now have you joined us? I believe no. he's here. Right, thank you. Mark and Maria Darian Smith. Now I do understand we have received some written submissions, but I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Morgan and Hannah Kelly. Yes, we're here. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, and, and to uh, to put forward our our, um, our comments with respect to this development application. Um, my name is Morgan Kelly. Uh, I'm the owner of Two Honda Road, um, so I'm directly next door to the proposed development of Four Honda Road. <clears throat> um, look, in summary, um, it's hard to say that um, uh, I look at echo everything that John has just said and, uh, and and agree completely with all the points that John's just made very eloquently. Um, a feature of the uh, Carabao Point area is that we have uh, an area which has large lots and they have a single high quality uh, residents on each of those. Um, the, the subdivision proposal turns one of those single lots, which is pretty comparable in size to most of the neighbouring properties, into two lots half that size. Um, and then notwithstanding the comments that were just made about the, the, the size of them, it's just simply not consistent with the, the remainder of the area. Um, on each subdivided lot, it's proposed to develop a dwelling that's larger than the current home on the existing lot. Um, the, I'm going to go into these points in a little bit more detail, but the proposed spend of $1.2 million suggests that the quality be significantly below the standard for the area. And I don't know how you could even like build an apartment for $1.2 million. And with, with the um, current pricing in the building industry, it doesn't seem to be uh, commensurate with the required spend that would be, be needed for this kind of development, at least for a quality one. And um, the plans demonstrate the characteristics of these properties won't be in keeping with the quality of the surrounding properties, particularly, for example, the, the, the roof. Um, the, the proposed subdivision doesn't meet council's own stated objectives, which are to retain the character, lot size, and protect the natural features of the site. Um, the council report states that it's going to ensure that subdivision and associated development promotes the desired future character of the neighbourhood through the consistent lot size. But this proposed subdivision doesn't promote the desired future character of the neighbourhood by, by changing the very nature of how these large blocks with large family homes, homes are used. Um, the dual height dwellings on, on, on a large block will create a completely different look and feel in one particular area, which unfortunately, as John's just pointed out as well, is one of the areas where so many people walk past regularly and enjoy the, the, the walks towards the Cremorne Point Walk along Honda Road and Bogota. Um, a single dwelling, if it was developed as a family home, would be much more sympathetic with the site and much more consistent with council's objectives. The, <clears throat> the council report says that the lots are able to accommodate low-density dwellings, uh, but these aren't really low-density dwellings either. They're three storeys, including basements. They cover most of the usable area of the site, and all that's left is a rock face at the back of the site. And again, I hope that council's had the opportunity to do a, a physical inspection. We actually, we've noted, because we have our uh, backyard is directly adjacent to the um, uh, to the to the property. That a lot of that land's now been cleared. There was vegetation on the uh, on the rock face at the back of the block, which has now been cleared. 
it's not usable land. Uh, it's a hard rock face. Uh, it's not soft landscaping. It won't absorb any stormwater runoff. And it brings me to the other major concern we have, which is the stormwater culvert, the Sydney water asset on the site, uh, which can't be considered usable space. We've observed over the five years that we've been resident in this house, that stormwater drain literally flooding. And there is a, an absolutely, in some circumstances, a terrifying amount of water that flows through that, uh, that stormwater drain. The fact that two houses are gonna be built with that stormwater drain in between them, it suggests some serious engineering uh, works are going to need to be conducted. And I think that $1.2 million, so look, I'm a layman, I'm an accountant, so I won't pretend that I've got expertise in, in property and construction, but that seems to me to be a very small, um, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be enough to, to rectify the, um, uh, the, the engineering and remedial works that would be needed to make that stormwater drain bigger or safe in between those two houses. As I've said, I've sent videos to council before of the stormwater drain um, flooding, in particular, just literally in the last in the last few months, um, the height of these developments is also um, not going to sit well within the block. It's going to cause a loss of light and shadowing. The the height of the house is over council guidelines already, um, so that's one particular area where I think council needs to at least enforce its own height restrictions. And I've already spoken to the um, to the costs of the um, uh, the, the inadequacy of the proposed costs in the budget. I mean, we've we've done renovation works ourselves on our house and, and those have all been done uh, sympathetically with the within the character of the area, including even getting council approval for the color of the paint. Um, so we, we've got an idea of the bill cost that, that is required for, for, this kind, for, for this kind of development and we just can't see that it's possibly adequate. Um, the assessment report says that the proposal is considered to be in the public interest. Look, I fail to see how this can be of the public interest, given all the points that I've just made, um, and also the, for the people who regularly walk the area. Um, and a lot of those people have lodged objections as well. Um, the development's going to remove tree canopy and important wildlife corridors and habitats as well, which is a great concern. There are a number of frogs and birds and other wildlife which enjoy the gardens of 400 Road and our garden and the gardens of the area. Um, the, the rock face at the back, which has now been cleared, is also an important wildlife habitat. Um, so it's difficult to see how this is actually in the in the public interest. Um, look, I won't go into the stormwater issues again. I think I've spoken for long enough. So look, thank you very much, Council, for your time, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present these uh, these points to you. Uh, we respectfully request that Council decides to reject the DA in its current form for the site. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just clarify for you, Mr. Kelly? This is a, an independent panel. It'll be determining the development application as opposed to the council, because it falls into the category of um, 10 or more objections. And that's why okay, we've got public. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. Apologies. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, that's fine. Um, so I have Councillor Mary-Anne um, yep. yep. Could you um, go down to sit next to um, Beatty? Yep. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, apologies. I didn't actually expect to be here. Um, we had an AGM. Yeah, you, you, might, you might address also the people. We, can I just say that um, Councillor Berge is here in person because she ha has um, been in a meeting next door, which we, she will be going back to. So as soon as we've heard from her, she'll be returning to her meeting. But um, she did register to address the panel. Thank you. Oh, sorry. We've got one question of you, Mr Kelly, from um, Lloyd Graham. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Kelly, you just touched briefly on um, privacy and overshadowing. I assume your property is to the west of the subject land. And uh, if so, do you have a concern with overshadowing onto your property and any privacy concerns? I do, very much so. We have a swimming pool that's on the uh, on the boundary between the two. Well, it's actually it's back from the boundary, um, and we have grown a hedge um, between the two sites. But this uh, development will overshadow our swimming pool and also look down into it. Thank you. But yeah, I have a, I have a significant concern about privacy and overshadowing in that regard. Thank you. Oh, and there's also a major living area, a balcony, um, which is proposed. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, my wife's telling me. Sorry, my wife's having some issues with this as well. Sorry. Um, sorry, they, they will look directly into our living room and our kitchen as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Kelly. Um, thank you, Councillor. 
Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Berrigi. I'm appearing as a resident, uh, not as a councillor. Um, I live in Caraba Point um, and uh, speaking uh, and heard uh, the, um, the other conversations from the other landowners around. Um, I'm sorry, I have my notes at home, so I'm kind of on a bit on the fly because I did expect to be back home and the meeting ran over. Um, I have significant concerns about this um, about this uh, DA, um, and I will say it is an, on an iconic walk. It's a, not only just a Sydney iconic walk; it's an Australian iconic walk, and it's an international iconic walk. And we often say, look at developments such as the Blues Point Tower, and go, "Oh my goodness, how did that happen?" And that's what we're faced with today. This is a, completely out of character with uh, what is there. We are a it is in a conservation zone. It is heavily trafficked by pedestrians and by cars. It does not suit the character. That does not mean that uh, I, I object to any development, but this is an inappropriate development in an inappropriate site. In relation to the traffic, I'm absolutely astonished that there's not a traffic management plan that has been uh, asked to be prepared for this. I think it's about the first uh, application I've seen without one. Caraba Point is literally one road in and one road out. I think one of the speakers uh, commented that, uh, we, that the road made the Channel 9 news recently because cars couldn't get through. Um, and people had spray painted no parking on the road. Well, they weren't the residents. It was the garbage trucks because when cars are parked as they are, nobody can get through and the trucks can't get through. And a traffic management plan needs to stipulate the size of vehicles that are available to be used for this site. There is already a development site to its left and to its right, as you would have seen when you went through. Caraba Point is under enormous pressure at the moment with three huge developments um, going on, two um, in the wings. Um, we know it's lovely and everyone wants to be there, but we actually can't get, we can't park, we can't get in and out of the site and not to have a traffic management plan which recognises that the garbage trucks have to get through on Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings, and the site is incredibly constrained by access, and there must be a restriction on the size of the trucks that are going to be um, permitted. Um, I have an enormous concern about the geotechnical work, which I feel is insufficient. It is subject to flooding down there. You can, I mean, it is damp all of the time. The, the, the proposal seeks to take away a lot of the soft landscaping and lots of um, soft land, which actually absorbs the water. What this means is that the water is going to have to go somewhere and that is going to be onto neighbouring properties. I can't, I've read the geotech and I cannot understand how that is going to happen. I've noted that there is a recommendation that the floors be lifted, um, but I haven't seen any then subsequent that to me, if the floors are going to get lifted, then the height's going to get lifted and we already have a height breach. Um, so that hasn't been um, uh, teased out as well. Um, the other thing um, is that there was a comment. People love the, the character and it is preserved by the, um, under the um, Hamon Point Conservation and, and Caraba Point Conservation. And to the point that, you know, you're pretty much told by council what colour you can paint your fence, what colour you can paint your house, what finishes you have to put on. What is being proposed is completely out of step with the area. Again, this is not a comment about not wanting a development. This is not a comment about, um, being, you know, not, not people not wanting to improve their properties. Of course, everybody's entitled to that. But we have controls for a reason. We, you know when you buy, you are in a conservation zone. I have previously owned a heritage house and I'm aware of the restrictions that have if you are in one or you are beside one. And that is right because people want to be able to see the heritage items from close and from afar. If you uh, have an item that is anywhere near the Sydney Harbour, you, you have the view and you must take that into account of the view of the, of the item from the public space. This this site is from the public space on a very traversed um, and busy walk, walkway, which is iconic. By all means, develop it. I, I have a. I understand that the site can be subdivided, um, and I don't disagree with that. But the problem is the amount of usable space, and they are creating a lot of what I would say unusable land and creating usable land, and that impacts the water. And where will the water go? Um, I've seen the videos. I've had similar issues uh, as well. If you live at the bottom of a hill, you get all of the water. The water has to go somewhere. I have a great concern about the tree loss. 
Um, as you would know, tree canopy in, in North Sydney is declining at an, at an alarming rate. The majority of that is either on private land or as a result of state government works. And wherever we can maintain tree canopy, I think we should. Um, the design, uh, the conditions are enormous. Um, and I don't think that the panel, um, it, it, I would ask that the panel uh, refuse and ask for amended plans to be put in rather than huge lots of conditions, which, uh, you know, then are kind of the, it loses the uh, ability of the community to have any say on it. If there are going to be amended plans, then I ask that they um, be put back to the community for comment. Um, and I'm sorry I'm a bit all over the place because I haven't got my notes, but I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Do you have a question, Lloyd? <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> Meredith, well, yes, yes, I've got a question because yeah. you talk about um, the iconic walk and what this will look like from the public sphere. Do you have specific criticisms in terms of, because of, um, you're talking about the design of, it's not development per se, no. it's these two buildings. It is, and it's it's, it's the look of what the, the finished product will look like. It, it's, a, it's At the moment, um, it's one building, and, of course, when you have two, that does change the look, but it uses all of the land around it. And it takes away the setback and the relief that you get because it's not just that building you're wanting to look at, it's all the heritage items around it. And that, and I do say, like you look at Blues Point Tower and you go, how can that be there? Um, we just, all, all I'm asking for is that the development be sympathetic to the environment in which it exists and which it has existed for quite a long time, just like the other heritage items around it. And when I look at it, it's like um, a sore thumb and and I just think that we could, you know, the, the, the objectives of the conservation area is to maintain the character, and this is completely out of character. So you think it's an, it's an unsympathetic it's very, I find it's yeah. a very unsympathetic response in what is a, is a beautiful, as you've all seen it, it's beautiful, there's trees, it's, you know, you feel like you're in a gully before you go to the walk, uh, off to the Cremorne Point walk or off to the Caraba Point walk, but that corner will just stand out like a sore thumb. And I don't think any amount, given the amount of space that they're looking to build on, uh, any landscaping is going to be way insufficient. Actually, I... I well, you do have a question. Yes, I knew you'd have one. Oh. I, I was just thinking how to frame it. Oh, you, God. You, you, um, you accept, don't you, that you can subdivide this land? Oh, absolutely. Look, it, it, is, it is permissible, whether it's um, optimal you know, is another determination. But yes, I agree, you know, we are within controls. But the way that it's been subdivided is very awkward. And so it actually doesn't reflect well on the on the view of the of the new the new design from the road. Okay. So you, you accept I do accept sub, subdivision sorry. is allowable, but I accept it's, it's the way in which it's subdivided that you you're not uh, yeah. comfortable with. Yeah. I mean and look also you're not comfortable with the development being proposed, the two-storey development, you're not comfortable with that. I agree that it can be, yeah, I agree that it can be subdivided. That's fine. I don't agree with the way that they've yeah. tried to subdivide it, but it is permissible, yeah. but it's not optimal. Yeah, but you want a different design? As something that's more structure. engaging and, and structure and more sympathetic to what is around, what, what is its surroundings, because it, otherwise it takes away from the heritage items. Okay. And I think that's un, that would be really unfortunate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll let you um, adjourn to your other meeting. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, supporting me, Ben. So um, we have now Jill Scully. Are you available? Um, I don't think we can see you, but I believe that you're online. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, right here, please, please address the panel. Yes, good, good afternoon, panel. My name is Bill Tullock. I have an architectural background. I was CEO of a major architectural practice in London for many years with offices throughout Europe and the UK, dealing with major commercial buildings, but principally virtually every other one had heritage, either working on heritage items or working immediately adjacent to heritage items. Um, I know Caraba Point well. I lived there for many years. Uh, my, my main thesis at university related to Efferson, uh, Edward Jefferson Jackson, um, and so I did a lot of research into the 
early architects that uh, designed and lived in that particular area, including, including the surrounding streets. Uh, Ten neighbours that surround the subject site have requested that I address the panel in relation to the DA. Two of them today have obviously spoken to you and you have obviously had a number of other written submissions from them. Uh, I'll try not to repeat what they've said because um, they've said those, um, stated those issues extremely well. So I'll try to summarise my thoughts and uh, my particular concerns. Uh, eight of the 11 surrounding neighbouring properties are heritage listed. Uh, seven, seven of these properties face either Honda Road or Bogota, or Bogota Road. Um, obviously, I will be speaking against the DA. The concern of neighbours are through, basically surrounding three items, the subdivision, heritage conservation, and quality built form and quality urban environment. And I refer to the panel to my submission dated 23rd of December, last year that details those matters in, in, in greater detail. I won't go through those in, 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 in the detail within that submission. But my particular concern is the applicant has not considered by any detailed analysis the prevailing cadastral pat pattern of either Honda, uh, Honda Road or Bogota Road. Of great concern, Council's assessment report has also failed to consider by any analysis whatsoever the prevailing cadastral pattern of both of those streets, which as I say, contain many heritage items. Uh, my contention is that the assessment report has failed to adequately address the objectives of the LEP clause 4.1 lot size and importantly objective 1A. Now, obviously, the DA meets the numerical controls of the LEP, but I simply contend that it does not meet the objectives of the, of the LEP. And the LEP objective 1A, of course, says to ensure that subdivision and associated development promote, promotes the desired future character of the neighborhood through consistent lot size, shape, orientation, housing density. Another key word there is, of course, consistent always happening in a similar way is the definition. I, I want to just refer the panel, and I won't go too long, because I know you don't like referring to too many land environment court cases, but one particular in November last year by Commissioner Lynn Sheridan, which was the Threlfro versus uh, Inner West Council, um, where the, uh, Commissioner Sheridan agreed with council's position in that case and dismissed the, uh, dismissed the appeal, stating that the prevailing cadastral pattern to be, to be is the typical character, characteristics of up to 10 allotments on either side of the subject site and corresponding number of allotments directly opposite the subject site. Now, the, if the panel look at it, this, this particular area of Honda Road is obviously quite special. Um, it, it, it can of a, a very unique area of so uh, so really my main contention is that when you look at the that last case that I referred to plus the five other recent LEC decisions that I listed in the December uh, submission is that I do feel that it, that this area is a unique zone within the conservation area and this valley contains multiple heritage sites with a, this particular valley, a valley, residential in character with predominantly substantial freestanding one and two story dwellings on large allotments. Now that's what I would contend is true, but I'm not the only one. The applicant's heritage consultants, Weir Phillips on, on page 15, describes the surrounding area exactly the same way. Residential in character, predominantly substantial freestanding one and two story dwellings on large allotments. Sorry, I've got a large truck going past me. So the issue here is that even the applicant confirms that these are large allotments. Um, and the earlier decisions really, it, it really suggests that the cadastral pattern is the existing site is of the same lot size and shape as the subject site prior to any subdivision. So if you look at those LEC cases, and there's multiple LEC cases, 
that they say you need to go down to obviously the 10 properties around the subject side, not looking at down the other end of Karaba Point where you may have sites of 400 square meters. You do not have them in the surrounding cadastral pattern of the area. What we end up with is a subdivision which is half of the size of the other properties in that area. Now that doesn't meet the objective. So I say, although it meets the numerical control, it does not meet the objective. And therefore I ask the, the panel to refuse the DA. No, no conditional consent, a re straight refusal of the DA on these grounds. That the proposed lots are significantly smaller in area and different in shape to the prevailing character cadastral character of both Honda Road and Bogota Road, and the proposal does not reflect or reinforce the predominant subdivision pattern of the street. The second point is that the area, dimensions and shape of the proposed subdivision is inconsistent with the prevailing cadastral pattern, and so the application must fail. It follows that the development consent can only be refused. That's my submission today. Chair, thank you very much for for hearing me. Thank you very much. We probably have some questions, Brendan. Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, look, um, one of the things we're looking at is an actual proposal. And um, what I'm really interested in hearing from you is if you could do it in the most um, efficient way, talk about the outcomes of the built form proposed and how it actually then impacts on streetscape and the surrounding heritage so that we can actually respond directly to this, this proposal. Certain, Talk certain. about the subdivision pattern, we'd like to know, following on from the subdivision pattern, how does the built form then pick up the symptoms of being inconsistent? Well, it's, well, uh, the, well, the first thing is that quite obviously, each of the surrounding 10 properties are individual houses on individual sites with uh, quite generous setbacks, two stories in a, a very controlled zone. So there's a large landscape interface between buildings and it also within each of the lots, uh, lots themselves. This building obviously attempts to maximize all controls to the full. Now that's not the nature of all the other buildings in the area. They have not maximized the sites to the absolute full. And therefore, by doing so, creates an inconsistency of the character between what is proposed in terms of putting two fairly dense built forms with minimal provisions in terms of setbacks and obviously non-compliances to heights they've pushed the boundaries and maximized every envelope control to the full. And therefore what you end up getting from a streetscape point of view is simply two buildings where really the streetscape would accept one building. And that's indeed what the neighbors really would have preferred to see. That was their legitimate expectation that the site would be re redeveloped with a substantial single building of design excellence on that corner. And that is really the heart and the nub of the problems of all the speakers today. It's that overdevelopment of having two buildings on, on a site, which predominantly all the other building, all the other lots in the surrounding area, all have got one. So it's really that pattern that get, gets disturbed and it gets disturbed in a vital location on the intersection of these two important streets. Once it's gone, it's gone. Does that mean other properties in the street can subdivide if they've got the right amount of numerical control? And what do we end up with? We end up with a street which is then subdivided down into 400 meter lots. It's obviously not in the interest, the public interest for that to occur. Um, and therefore, for those reasons, it needs to be refused. Do you have any comments about the roof form, the flat and the hipped roofed? Sort of these funny, there's hipped, then there's flat on the top. Well, I and understand. the language yeah. used? Well, the language is unfortunate. Um, the, the, what I understand this situation of how this d design d developed 
that it was actually a flat roof design originally and and the council staff obviously wanted a pitch roof so a pitch roof was put onto a of, of that scheme to reflect a pitch roof outcome i must say really what the residents are looking for is a, des is a design excellence on this corner um, and that is the main problem with what we end end up with with two buildings forced onto this relatively modest site which is the same as as the others um, in terms of the roofscape, to me, it's, it, it simply is a byproduct of council officers requesting a pitch roof. It didn't seem to be a, a convincing concept to start with um, an idea of trying to achieve something of excellence on this site um, by coming up with a design more appropriate um, to the surrounding quality built forms, um, particularly those immediately across the street, but we have water house houses, obviously, uh, in the area as well, in, in that mix. Um, the quality really, I don't think, uh, is up to the mark for this conservation area on such an important street. We need a, a, a built form of excellence, and we don't have that. Thank you, Mr. Tullock. Just, um, are there any other questions for the panel? No. So you would not object to, for example, an attached dual occupancy because it would be, um, I guess, more um, or it could be designed such that it would be more in keeping with the scale, the large scale of dwellings that we see within the area. Is that what I hear? Um, I would most probably think that uh, a single residence is most probably more suited as well. If you so as soon as you go down the dual occupancy line, you've got multiple garaging um, configurations, which really um, doesn't suit that part of the conservation area either. No, I, th I think that I think the right solution here is an individual uh, dwelling, substantial dwelling of design excellence. That's okay. what I would think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just go back to Curtis and Shirley Davies. I believe you're online. Didn't you say, Peter? Yep. Not yep. Oh, no. no, no, they're not online. Sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed anybody out. Um, no, sorry, I, I think I mentioned earlier that um, we're aware that uh, Curtis couldn't make it today because of an urgent work issue. Right. Okay, then no, that's fine. And Sandy, just double check that you're not there. No, they're observing. You're observing only. Thank you very much. Um, can I invite Kerry Gordon? And do we have the architect for this as well, Kerry here? Uh, no, unfortunately, the architect didn't make the deadline for putting his name down. Well, there aren't any deadlines for the um, applicants, architect, designer, putting their name down. But anyway. Um, that wasn't my understanding. So he uh, did want to be here, but he missed the deadline. Well, OK, then we probably would have had some questions of the architect. In fact, we always encourage architects to be available to address the panel. Okay, Kerry Gordon, you've heard what um, uh, others have had to say. So can I invite you to um, respond to some of those issues? I'll go through the submissions and then I'd like to address two of the conditions. Um, thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Um, the first person who made submissions was Mr. Kennedy. Kenny, sorry. Um, his concerns related to breach of the height control and the fact that the proposal didn't follow the topography. The proposal breaches the height control in two very specific locations. The first one is at the corner of an eave and that breach is relating to the fact that the stormwater channel is being relocated and that corner of the eave is over the existing stormwater channel which is up to 1.9 metres deep. So if the building dropped down to be consistent with the height control in that small location, you would end up with a part of a building 1.9 metres lower than all the rest of the building in a situation when that topography is not going to be visible in the future. So it makes no sense. It makes more sense to actually breach in that location. The second um, breach of the height control relates to the pitched roof. And as was alluded to by Mr Tullick, um, originally the design had a flat roof. The reason the design had a flat roof uh, was to minimise its visibility and because the existing dwelling on the site has a flat roof. So that approach was seen as the best way forward, given the existing building on the site is a neutral building. 
um, and given that it adjoins um, a building to the west that's not an item and buildings to the east on the other side in Bogota Road that are not items. Yes, there is an item across the road in Honda and there are items behind, but the majority um, of the immediately adjoining um, developments that we will see either the changes to dwelling one or um, where you will see the changes to dwelling, the new dwelling two from the adjoining properties, um, they're not heritage items. Uh, you will see it from the street and yes, there's a heritage item opposite that you'll see it from. So that's the reason why there's a second bridge, simply because council required uh, a pitched roof to be put on the development. Um, the design of the building um, was a focus of a number of the submissions. The design of the building has gone through a very long process as it has the design of the subdivision where uh, we went uh, to a pre-DA with council and were given guidance by council's heritage expert in particular. We followed that guidance at every step of the way. We then lodged, there were further requested changes by the heritage consultant and council's planner, which we did, um, and further changes again. So every single change that's been requested, we have done. Um, at the request of the consultants, uh, the staff. Um, there was a suggestion that the development was an overdevelopment of the site. The proposal complies with the minimum lot size. My understanding of how the legislation works is if you comply with a numerical control, the objectives have no role to do legally. So the fact that it complies with the 450 is the relevant point. Um, having said that, when you're looking at this conservation area, this conservation area has a very eclectic um, subdivision pattern. And the difference between this and various other judgments that have occurred is the way the, um, the controls are written in this particular case. They're completely different to the controls written, um, for example, in Inner West um, LEPs and DCPs. If you look at the subdivision pattern of this area, it has a number of irregular shaped lots, which we, we are currently, and we've retained the irregular shape of the lot, although from the street, it will look like a regular allotment. You wouldn't appreciate the angling of the um, boundary at the rear. Um, in terms of the size, there are a significant number of other properties in the conservation area with a similar size. In fact, there's one just around the corner um, from the subject site, um, which, is immediately to the west of the adjoining property. Um, so neither of the so characteristics. Can I, can, I, can I just ask you a question there, Kerry? Um, yes. So what about within the visual catchment? The visual catchment, um, it depends on where you stand, basically. So if you stand at the corner um, property, you will see the smaller lots. Mm -hmm. at, um, at the corner of the western side of Honda Road, you'll see the smaller lots. If you stand on the corner of no, the road. No, when I talk about the visual catchment, that is the catchment from that lot itself. Looking out from that lot? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, the only people looking out from that lot would be the residents. So yes. normally when you're looking at whether something fits in the conservation area, you look at the catchment from well, the street. Yes, well, well, fair enough. Well, how about you go diagonally opposite where the two roads intersect. So that's what I was talking about. So the first one is where the two, two roads intersect from the west. Yep. From, from that, you would also see smaller um, allotments up, um, what's the name of the road, Shell Cove Road. Um, and you don't see a standard pattern. The allotments address Honda Road at strange angles. Um, and also you don't see a standard size of allotment either. So there are some wide ones, there are some narrow ones. When you're addressing it from Bogota, you have a very similar thing because you can see the site, but you can also see up towards the end of the um, cul-de-sac in Bogota, and they're very narrow frontages and wedge-shaped lots up at that end. So there is no consistency, and that's what council has considered in this case. If it was in a street where they are all rectangular blocks of the same size, I would agree that it's inappropriate. But that's not the case here. This is a highly inconsistent subdivision pattern in this area. Um, and neither the shapes of the lot or the size of the lot are inconsistent with the wider Caraba area or even what you can see from the corners. 
Um, so that would be my response to that one. Um, one of the other concerns was with the design and a suggestion that it was substandard quality. Um, that hasn't been raised by council or council's heritage person. The 1.2 million would have been an amount that was identified originally and council asked for a costing. The development has morphed quite a lot since then. Um, the council asked us to do additional works on the existing dwelling to put a pitch roof on so that it would respond better to the conservation area than the current flat roof. And the amount of stormwater works have changed quite a bit um, since it was first lodged. So that, I don't think there's any... So there wasn't a revised CIV? I don't know whether there was. I am unaware if there was. But that was the figure that was originally lodged. So it's not indicative of the quality of the build or anything like that. The materials and the colours were selected pretty much by council's heritage expert. So um, we did what we were told. Um, so that's why visually it's ended up the way it has. Um, in terms of the side setbacks, they are very consistent with a lot of dwellings in this conservation area. Um, in fact, the distance between number three, Honda, and it's immediately joining property south side setbacks are the same. So I don't think there's a concern with that. In terms of impact on trees, the significant majority of vegetation on this site is being retained. The whole idea of this design of dwelling two was to retain the significant vegetation in the rear yard of that property. That was fully supported by council. Um, some of the trees that are being taken out don't require approval because they're undersized. Um, and we're retaining the significant trees to the Honda Road frontage. So there will be a mature landscape setting immediately when the building is built. So I, I haven't, I don't see that that's um, a major concern in terms of assessment of the application. There was concern raised in terms of the wildlife corridor. There was an assessment done by a council ecologist in terms of that and subject to the retention of the vegetation in that rear portion behind the swimming pool, which is being done, then their, concer their concerns, um, sorry, they don't raise concerns. They want that area um, fenced off as habitat during the construction to ensure that it stays, all, stays as it is. And they have no concerns that the frogs will have a problem if that is done. So that's the way that um, we will do it. Um, can in I terms ask, of sorry, can I just yes. ask you a question? Sorry to interrupt. Just while it's yes. in my fresh in my mind, um, the size of the lots is that exclusive of the um, drainage easement, or is that inclusive of the drainage easement? There's no requirement in the standard instrument to exclude it. Now I understand that, but I'm asking you what percentage? So it includes it, okay. because it's the it's the site um, area so as required under the definition. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand the usable area of land um, and excluding that, what would be the size of the lots? Have you done that calculation? No, because it's not a calculation required by the LEP, so it hasn't well, been done. It's a, it is just a circumstance of the site and it, it, it would sort of inform us in terms of the development potential. Okay. Um, we haven't been asked to do that any time, so that hasn't been done. Um, in terms of the development potential and suggestions that it's an overdevelopment, it's noted that relocating that drainage easement has it going between the dwellings in an area that you don't normally use other than just to walk up and down. Um, it will be covered by removable panels, so it's usable, and part of the area is actually part of a deck for dwelling one. So those areas are usable. Um, they're not being made unusable by the um, stormwater channel. Um, the thing that's unusual about this application is that it complies with every control except height. Um, I've almost never come across one that does. Like we're talking all of the site setbacks are compliant. The site um, coverage built unbuilt upon and landscape areas are all compliant. There was a suggestion that there's not enough landscaping but it's fully compliant and there is a large area of landscaping to the rear that will be retained. 
um, which is a very established garden, it will be staying there and you will be seeing some of the trees above the um, dwelling, above dwelling too from the street. So it's not, and there's a large tree at the front which will partially screen dwelling too from the street, soften it. Uh, so it's not um, a case where we're going in and bulldozing the site and pulling out every tree. We're selectively pulling out a few trees, a number of which don't need approval to be removed. Um, the next concern was about the traffic management plan. Uh, the planner went to council's engineer to see whether a traffic management plan was required. The engineer said that it wasn't. So therefore we haven't done one. Um, one would be done at the construction certificate stage and it would take into account all of the concerns that were raised by the residents. That's the normal process. The only time construction certificate plans are required up front is usually on major roads, which so, this is not. So would you object to a condition then that required a construction management plan prior to CC? No. That, that would be a normal condition that would normally go on, so we would have no concern with that. Um, in terms of, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I address all the submissions. Um, there was a lot made of the fact that we're putting two dwellings on a lot where everyone else is one dwelling on a lot. But the end product is one dwelling on each lot. The lots are not smaller than a number of lots. And I'm not talking one or two, I'm talking a substantial number of lots in the conservation area are of similar size to this, including one fairly close to the west. Um, so I don't see that that is a reason to refuse it, particularly when it's fully compliant with the control. Um, I don't think it's reasonable to say that the Caraba Point Conservation Area is characterised by large lots and large dwellings. Um, parts of it are, but parts of it are also characterised by quite narrow fronted lots. And this would, the development is quite consistent with that. Um, it has a five and a half metre front setback for landscaping, which is was the requirement of council and is compliant with what they requested. Um, no usable space, I've addressed that. Um, in terms of stormwater, there were major discussions all the way through this from before it was even lodged about stormwater and flooding and how to handle it. Um, the design raises the dwelling so that it's above the flood level by 500 mils, um, which is a requirement. Um, so we have done that. The existing dwelling is currently under the flood level, but works are being done, um, which will protect it better than it currently is in terms of keeping water out. There's a condition of consent which requires the same amount of on-site storage to be retained um, as is an existing case. So there will be no external impacts in terms of flooding. Uh, the flooding will occur on the site and the design is catering for that um, being elevated. So can um, you just, sorry, Kerry, can you tell me the percentage of the existing house that will be retained? Uh, I haven't seen a demolition plan of what would be retained. Okay, so if you go to the um, floor plan. Yep. So probably the one on page 113 of the document is probably the best because that shows the roof. So you can see the existing garage to the left, that's retained. Where it says existing roof, that's a two-storey element that's retained. Where it says new pitched roof, that's retained underneath a new pitched roof. And the addition is that small pitched roof at the front. And then part of the dwelling is also demolished, which currently straddles the um, stormwater channel and is not in a very good location for any part of the dwelling because it straddles the channel. So the majority, the significant majority of that building is being retained. Um, and the only reason we're changing the roof on the dwelling is because council asked us to, otherwise the roof would have stayed as is as well. It would have just been the addition to the front and the demolition to the back and then opening up and putting a balcony on. So quite um, relatively modest changes to that one. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm just sort of thinking, given the flood levels and that this still doesn't, I know I know you can do alterations and additions, but at the same time, does it not provide the opportunity to build a home within this area that is above that flood level? 
which would be required of any new dwelling today because that, that house certainly looks like it's um, past its use by date. Um, um, yep, there's no um, obviously requirement to do that. Um, it's wholly consistent with the floodplain controls in that it's improving the situation for the existing dwelling and the new component is fully constructed in terms of flood safety. So it will have all the power points elevated, it'll be constructed in materials that can withstand floods, all of that sort of thing. So there was a lot of back and forth between council's engineers and, and our, our stormwater and hydraulic engineers. And in the end, council's fully satisfied that this is not of concern. Right, okay then. But I, I have a, a question, question there um, because dwelling two does include um, a couple of basement rooms which are well below yes. flood level. And I know yes. that they're not labelled as habitable space, but it would be very easy for somebody to convert that in the future to a workroom which would be habitable space and would then be below the flood level. Is that correct? Well, you couldn't convert it to habitable space without approval. Um, and the point is it won't flood anyway because the engineers have worked on that in particular and there's no external doors to it. So the only way you can get to it is from the level above and the level above is above the floor, the flood level. So yes. therefore water won't get down into that. So that, that structure is fully tanked then? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fully designed so that floods can never get into either basement. That was one of the major discussion points other than the culvert and the um, the stormwater channel and also ensuring that no addition, no loss of flood storage happens on the site. You, you referred to the floor level of dwelling two being half a metre above the flood level. It's actually 300 millimetres. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, um, half, half a metre is the New South Wales standard, so this is less than that. The requirements um, are something that the engineers, as I said, fully discussed and agreed are appropriate to the site. So I wasn't advised that there were any concerns with flooding from council in this design. We've done everything that council wanted in terms of flooding and more. I mean, at the moment, the, um, there's no easement over the stormwater drain and we're providing an easement over the stormwater drain. Um, at the moment, it's unsafe because it's not covered. We are covering it with removable panels so it can be accessed for maintenance, but it's safe for the public and for the, and for the owners on the site. Um, so there's a lot of cost going on to the site in terms of public benefit of the stormwater system and, and safety. Um, in, in that regard, Kerry, would the applicant accept a condition to require that they maintain that? I don't know if they could legally do that if it's an easement in favour of other people. Well, the, um, the definitely, the difficulty, definitely. The difficulty is if you have part of your veranda that's over the um, stormwater and then it's not functioning and nobody can see it, um, it, it seems to me that it's something, given the design, that the applicant would have to commit to maintaining that free flow of that drainage system. So what what it is at the moment, um, there's going to be panels that you can see through over the entire channel except for where the veranda is. They're all removable and the part of the veranda that's over the, system, over the channel is a removable panel as well. And we've agreed to a condition which requires the owner to foot the cost of removing and replacing that deck. And that's the standard approach that you would normally do to provision of access um, to the stormwater channel. You can see the stormwater channel from the street frontage if you stand and look over the low fence that's there. So any blockage would be very obvious regardless of whether the deck is over it. You were talking about um, a lot of cost is uh, being incurred in terms of the uh, um, the flooding, etc. Um, but presumably, there's a fair amount of cost being saved by um, extending the existing dwelling as opposed to knocking that down and building a new one with a floor level above the flood height. Is that correct? No, unfortunately, when you renovate, it usually costs more than when you knock down and rebuild. So it was just that was the way the process started with our pre-DA. Um, 
So we so didn't think we would be allowed to knock it down and rebuild. So that's why we went down that path. But it's it's not a contributory item. No, um, no, it's neutral. But usually, neutral items aren't allowed to be demolished. No, well, not now. We no. And not if it's um, really a detraction. Um, I don't agree with that. Uh, anyway, um, can, can I speak? Um, yes. Um, Kerry, it's really disappointing that the architect's not here because a lot of the, the issues that we're talking about we, I would have expected to see in the architectural proposal, including an analysis of the existing area that actually showed how the built form and the gardens fit with its surrounding context, its conservation area. But the closest I could get to that was finding a hydraulic drawing that had an aerial photograph with all the surrounding lots. And I just want to say to you that all the surrounding lots are very large and they're precisely as they were described by Bill Tullo. So I'd say that I disagree with you strongly. The other thing is the a lot of the objections were talking about the public domain. And that, that means talking about the street and how the building appears to the street. So when I look at the street, from the street view of the two buildings, and I notice that the way the drawings have been arranged, we don't see the two buildings together. But when I see them on this aerial and I've drawn them on, they do look like a pretty standard subdivision anywhere in Sydney, where the buildings are 1.8 apart, metres apart, and 900 metres off the boundaries at the sides. Like this, you must admit, is an outcome that has been created by the rear of the site being the concentration of all the landscape and the street frontage having the concentration of this bulk and producing a character that you do not find in this area. So I really have to refute what you're saying. I'm talking about this street, these streetscapes, and I'm not actually able to find any evidence in the proposal of a of a um, response to these heritage concerns. So I just have to put that on the record. Yes, can I just can I just ask you to ask the question, Brendan, as opposed to just provide your well, uh, comments? Well, because... we were told something that was not completely right. Well, I'd just like to ask you to, uh, to put it in the context of a question. Okay. Now, in terms of the house number one, I really wonder when I look at the sections, I'm just wondering about your veracity that most of the house is kept because for a start, you're building a wine cellar under the garage. I'm just not sure yes. how it's being achieved. I couldn't tell you how it's going to be constructed, but it's it's going underneath the existing building, yes. Okay. But it's and not I'll... a very large wine cellar in, in terms of it would make the building structurally unsound. Um, yep. I mean, the, at the end of the day, when you're on um, Bogota as opposed to Honda, that dwelling on the corner is going to be brought forward onto Honda and then you've got the length of it and the double garage on the side street as well. So its footprint um, from the public domain is very significant. That garage already exists. I so know. the only change in the length of the building yeah, what I'm is, saying, what I'm saying is the rumpus room. Yeah, the following on from what we were talking about in terms of what part of the house is to be retained and could yes. you, in fact, get a better outcome if you didn't want to um, salvage what, what remains of it? And, in fact, is that the best approach? As I said before, that's, that's the, the heritage that, controls require us to keep the house. So we can no. only demolish the house. No, no, the, no, the heritage controls don't require you to keep the house at all. It's neutral. You're allowed to remove um, um, property um, dwellings that um, degrade from or detract from. But my understanding is that ones that are neutral, you're supposed to retain. Well, I don't know when it was assessed as neutral, but I would say that it's not neutral today. Well, well, that's what it's called in the controls. We'll, we'll check um, internally, won't we? Yeah. Um, Kerry, the other thing I'd like to ask you is um, when I look at the house number two, it seems as though uh, the, the underside of the house is all open, right? The water can just flood in that area. That's the intention. 
that's part yeah. of the flood storage. So how do you how do you actually allow that to happen, but vermin not to also flood in that area? I'm sure it's something that occurs in a lot of sites because a lot of sites are designed in this way. I don't know the exact technical. Well, I don't know. I'm just looking at your drawings. But a lot of sites are elevated houses, and this is a partially elevated house. Well, it's not it's not explained anywhere, and there are very few levels on the plan, so it's really hard to know what, how this is being managed and controlled. Well, if you look at section three on page one hundred and twenty one, there's quite mm -hmm. an area that you can get underneath. So, presumably, it would be simply a matter of crawling under. Mm -hmm. It was more like, how do you protect the underneath part of the house? From being full of everything else it's like any other raised house it's you would have to maintain okay housekeeping the house has to be raised and it has to be open because otherwise there's no storage for flood now and another, if the house isn't raised then the house would flood another construction issue um we've heard that council told you to provide hip roofs but they're not really hip roofs are they they're I didn't yeah. say that. I said council provided a yes. pitched roof. I'm wondering how one. how you provide the flat roof and the tiled roof. How how are the materials? What are the materials of the flat roof? The flat roof is a garden. It's not um, a roof. So if you go to the floor plan on page 119 you'll see beside bedroom four is a garden, which is the flat roof. Not on house number two? Yeah, that's house number two. It's the garage. No, no, this, this bit in here. There's a bit, I think. I think not quite flat, perhaps. It, it's flat. It, it's pretty well flat. It's a, we could call it a skillion. Maybe it slopes at one degree. But I'm just wondering what the appearance is that as you come down the hill, you're looking at the top of your house and you're seeing that the roof is not, in fact, a hip roof. It's a flat roof on the top of the roof. Um, and what would be the appearance from all the heritage buildings? That, so you're talking about the, the lower pitched part on top? Yes. Not the right. garden? Sorry, yes. I misunderstood you. You have, you have tiled the appearance of what appears to be a hip roof from the street. Yes. But when you yes. get up above, that only goes up and then it turns into a, what we would call a flat roof on the top, I suppose, with metal. Yeah. Yeah. And I just the only reason that was done was to limit the height and the breach of the height control. The If it was to be raised, it would have no impact on views or anything of the like, um, no I, I, significant impact on anything. But yeah. that's what we did and Council's heritage expert was happy with to minimise the breach of the height control but still provide the visual um, pitched roof from the street. I was just wondering if you did any visual analysis of what that would look like from all the surrounding heritage buildings where they can see that and from, in fact, higher places in the topography looking down on these houses. No, so that was... It feeds into some of the concerns about the building quality. Um, the other thing is I was looking at your 3D representations along the streetscape which ask that question and they can you tell me is that a is that a um an accurate depiction of landscape along the edges of the building sorry i'm i haven't got that diagram that you're talking about so i can't respond to that there is a very large tree to the west western corner of lot the lot for dwelling two is that what you're talking about I'm talking about the street frontages and the landscape. I don't know what the landscape is that you're proposing. So there's a landscape plan attached to the um, material that you have. I'll just find the page number. So it starts at page 149. And what you've got in front of house two is you have the existing tree one, which is a, um, a Cedrus Diodora, and it's 10 metres high. So, oh, sorry, 15 high by 10 wide. So that is staying. Then in the front garden, you've got 
uh, LI, I'd say that would probably be a crepe myrtle. Yeah, crepe myrtle on the other side. So you've got you'll have two trees to the street frontage, one quite tall and one slightly smaller, and then that's underplanted. Um, so that's for house two. For house one, you've got an existing tree on the eastern corner. Um, which what's that? Pipachina. PCB, whatever a PCB is. Uh, PCB. Actually, no, that might be a new tree. Um, it's an ornamental pear, so that gets to six metres. And the other one is the crepe myrtle as well, um, which gets to five to eight metres. Um, so, again, there's two trees to that frontage and then there's under uh, um, landscape underneath. So that whole frontage to house one, is landscaped other than a path to the door and the grating over the stormwater channel. And in terms of house two, other than the driveway, which is narrowed at the street frontage um, and the pathway to the door, that's all landscaped as well. So they will be seen in quite a landscaped setting. I'm just- Because remembering you're not gonna be seen between the houses very often. Um, it's only from one one tiny location. And even in from between the houses, you've got the crepe myrtle at the front, which will be viewed in that context. I'll have to refer to this up somewhere else because I'm looking at the, the plan on page 149. I just don't know if that's a correct depiction. No, 149 does. You need to go further down. So you need to look at the following plans. So 150 shows the landscaping to house one which is what I just described. Mm -hmm. And then 160, uh, sorry, 151 um, shows the landscaping to house two, which is what I described. And you can see in the case of house two, that the majority of the existing landscaping at the back is exist, like is staying. So all of those will be retained, all of those trees and the understory. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very significantly landscaped set of dwellings. Um, just one further question. I have to ask you because I did ask the um, Mr. Tullick. Um, mm -hmm. Dual occupancy would be permissible, Perry? No, no, it's a, it's a conservation area and it's prohibited. Prohibited. So you couldn't have a dual occupancy that looked like one large home on a larger allotment? No, you couldn't. Right, okay. Um, I just want to have a very quick check to see that I've addressed all of the submissions. Talked about wildlife. Oh, there was a concern about um, privacy. But if you look at the western elevation, uh, so that's that plan page number. Sorry. So basically at the ground level. What DA okay. number? Yep, I'm just looking for it now. Uh, so it's so it's DA 15, which is on page 161, 116 of the document. Oh no, sorry, that's house one. Don't want to look at that one, wrong one. Um Sorry, it's DA 22. 22, okay, thank you. So when you look at that, you'll see that there are no windows on the ground floor and there are two windows on the first floor, both of which are to bathrooms, one of which is highlight and the other one is translucent up to above 1.5. So there is no privacy impact as a result of that development. Um, the only other thing I'd like to touch upon, unless you've got any other questions, is the there's two conditions um, that I'd like to address, which are contradictory to one another. So I just would like to take you to those. First one is condition C6, which is um, the heritage hey. condition, yep, which hey. is on page 66 of the document. Yes. 
Now, there's two. We have no concerns with the intent of any of the conditions. Um, it's just the way two of them conflict. So in this one, in um, A, it talks about, no, sorry, not A, um, C, it says privacy screens to be painted to match the dwelling in a visually submissive tone. Metal, metal finishes are not to be used. No problem with that. Um, and sorry, then... Sorry, just one moment. What page are we on again? It's 59. Uh, page 59. 59. 59, okay. Sorry, I gave you the wrong page number. Yep, yep, okay, yep. Um, so C, we have no problem complying with that one. And then the second part of it, but it conflicts with another one, which I'll take you to in a minute. And then the second part of it is where it talks about the fence, which is A, where it talks about the sandstone front boundary fence to houses one and two. So that's to um, Honda. Yep. Are to be retained to the existing height and restored if necessary, and then talks about a gate. So having those two conditions in mind, if we then go to condition 13C, which is on page 65. Yes. It requires... Um, is it C? Sorry, it's J, so it's on the next page. Um, at J on page 66, it says any proposed fence is to be constructed so as not to impede the natural overland flow. So all we would like to do is in 6C to add to the sentence subject to compliance with condition C, 13J. So the fence will be retained, but there may need to be some openings to satisfy the stormwater condition. And then the last, the other condition which conflicts with the one about the privacy screens is condition C23, and it's on page 72. So it requires fixed, obscured or frosted glass privacy screens to be attached to the western window, which is window W12. So that contradicts the requirement that the windows that the screens have to be painted and not metallic and presumably not glass. Um, the window in question is a window in dwelling one to an ensuite, and the only thing it looks over is the planted garden over the roof of the garage of dwelling two. Um, obscure glazing on the window would probably be enough. Because the second sentence says the window is to comprise fixed, obscure or frosted glass, whereas the first sentence says it's got to have a privacy screen attached. So the privacy screen is referred to in C C6C. C. It just tells you what you're supposed to do to all privacy screens, so it would apply to this one as well. Okay. But so this one's... so are you saying that should be except window... 12. I think you could just delete the first sentence because you don't need a privacy screen and obscure glazing. They do the same thing. So the second sentence is the window to comprise fixed, obscure or frosted glass. Yep. But what I'm so saying you don't need no, a screen moment. in front of that. Yeah, one moment. So um, that's why I'm saying I mean C6C to say except W12, because that's that's dealt with in C23A. It is, but C23A requires obscure glazing to the window and yep. fixed, and then a privacy screen attached to it. So it's a tautology. Yeah. Which is a bit of an overkill. So yeah. I'm saying if you just take out the first sentence, yeah. then that fixes the problem. Mm. Yep. Right, okay, yep. So other than that, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, can I invite um, Meredith, do you have questions? I think I've probably covered most of, oh, there was actually one question. The, the actual form of subdivision, um, yes. you've, you've mentioned that a lot of the decisions were driven by um, 
discussions with council officers. Was the yes. form of subdivision also driven by that? The, one of the reasons the subdivision follows the pattern it does is because of the large um, landscaped area in the rear of the site. And we wanted to keep that all in one of the allotments and to not divide it by fencing. So that's one of the reasons why it skews at the rear and that it doesn't have a straight line between the two. Um, we could have straightened it, but we would have lost some of that vegetation and that was one of the main aims during the design to keep the vegetation. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lloyd? Yes, I'm just wondering how you react to Mr Tullock's proposal that there should be just one building of design excellence. How do you respond to that? Um, in two ways. The, the LEP allows the subdivision at 450. Um, and once you satisfy the numerical control, legally you don't go to any objectives, which is what Mr Tullock has done. So I don't agree with the way he's assessed that. In terms of it just being one dwelling, that is a development that is permissible, so it could theoretically occur. Um, you would have similar problems if you wanted to retain the landscaped area and the fact that you've got the channel through the site. Um, so it would be difficult to do a large dwelling on that site that didn't have built form in a similar location to what's proposed now. Um, in terms of it being design excellence, there's no design excellence criteria within the LEP. So we're not in a situation for residential flat buildings, for example, where there's a design excellence criteria. The criteria here is for it to be satisfactory in the conservation area, and council's expert has said it is, and we've followed their guidance in the design to achieve that. So it's not a matter of design excellence. If, if you were to put your mind to that, I would respectfully request that that would be incorrect legally. Thank you. Brendan? No, I don't. No? No further questions? Nothing further that you wish to add, Kerry? No. No, I think I covered all the, unless you can think of anything that is the objectors you wanted me to respond to, I think I covered them. Okay, then. Rightio. Well, um, the panel will be making a decision later on today and um, our decision will be on the website. Thank you. Okay. All right, then. Thank you very much, all of those who have participated in this item. Um, We'll now move, oh golly, we've been an hour and a half on the one item. So hopefully everybody is patiently waiting. Uh, and um, if you wish, the second item is also in a public meeting. So it's 317 Pacific Highway, North Sydney. And we have the people to address us. Um, bearing in mind, we have read the submissions to the public exhibition of it. And we've read the submissions that have, seven written submissions that have been made to the panel. So I'll just, run a um, roll call first. Michael Parker, I can see you're there on the line. I've been waiting patiently. Um, Gwen Young and Maceo Sumubo, are you there? Emmanuel and Kimberly? Yep, uh, we're here um, observing. Oh, you're observing. Okay, I didn't have that noted. Thank you. Joe Stanton, I believe I saw you on there before. I saw Joe. Yep. Joe's iPhone, I guess that's true. Joe, are you there? We might need to ring Joe. Uh, Justine Butler, yes, I can see you're there, thank you. And Sebastian Urban, are you there? No. Um, and James Lovell. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right, yo. So um, could we ask uh, Michael um, Parker to address panel. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Similar to the, the last group there, some of those names that you read out might relate to those that submitted a paper um, right. and may not be attending. So, um, But first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak against this development application. Um, our opposition, opposition as the body corporate um, and for personally myself, linked to Strata Plan 95394. Um, and we feel that there's significant um, detrimental impact um, that represents onto Two East Lane 
um, for its owners, uh, residents and the surrounding residents. Um, as mentioned in our paper, um, to East Lane's southern wall and our atrium opening adjoins 317 Pacific Highway. Uh, within our paper submitted to this panel, together with several direct property owners and residents of North City Council, there are numerous issues, irregularities, incorrect information and outstanding objections still to be addressed. While our paper highlights our core issues and concerns, it is felt critical that we get the, the opportunity to voice some of these items. Uh, namely, uh, firstly, many objections raised during the DA proposal phase or period have either been passed over or only a token response supplied by both the applicant and the council's assessor's report. Hence the need to redocument issues again through our paper to this panel. The body corporate initial objections were lodged uh, back in eighth September and followed by a further update on the 12th of October, which was hand delivered to the council in confidence. Um, a major concern for us is the visual solar and airflow of the construction um, that will occur across the atrium opening for levels one and two of our bidding, uh, building. And is also um, will have an impact to level three as well. So basically every resident owner is impacted by this. Um, in reading reports and correspondence and reviewing drawings, this aspect of the atrium has either been overlooked, misrepresented, or just skimmed over. The wall will significantly block the atrium on our southern boundary. Um, and I recommend, and it's pleasing to hear that the panel has read those papers, that they take particularly note of photos one through to five, which provide a level of indication of the volume of that impact. Um, there's no mitigation or even response has been offered to how we're able to maintain our southern wall. As shown in the photo uh, number six, um, within that panel paper, the wall is not flat, has decorative panels and indents that do require maintenance over time. Maintenance has already been listed for one panel on our northern boundary with a directive panel on the Pacific Highway frontage previously serviced. It is considered essential that we are provided the necessary access to maintain the sustainability and health of our property. It is unclear as to the actual proximity of the development wall to T East Lane. The drawings offered are considered to be inconsistent and appear to reflect it adjoining our property in some instances and also is referenced in the council's assessor's paper. We did notice, however, that correspondence on the DA file that the neighbour's consent is not required as flashing will no longer be necessary as a 20 millimeter gap will be present. This obviously makes maintenance impossible and increases the potential to damage our property during construction and the trapping of refuge, et cetera, given the minimal gap present. The existing, also the existence of a 75 millimeter easement has not been included in the drawings, which we consider a critical component for inclusion and consideration. Um, I did attach a copy of the easement drawing um, and location plans to, uh, to the panel as well. Furthermore, initial and more recent shadow drawings supplied in January are considered incorrect, with only a section of our atrium contained in those drawings. We believe overshadowing is significantly more than demonstrated in these drawings, and I refer to our comments in the uh, shadow drawing document that have been provided. Um, also concern are the incorrect drawings and comments supplied by the applicant, which are also reflected in the council's report, specifically the gates and supporting infrastructure erected by 317 Pacific Highway, which we consider are partially erected on to East Lane property. This has occurred without consent or even notification. The response in January from the developer states that all gates are erected on the property of 317 Pacific Highway, we would like to reference photo seven and eight that clearly dispute this statement. Photo eight also reflects the supporting post being affixed to our property, which obviously is damaging our own property without consent. Um, I will reference you to the drawings supplied with paper, with our paper titled DA231 with Gates, which highlights these misrepresentation and false um, comments. Um, there are numerous other issues that require resolution that are contained within objections previously lodged and recent papers submitted to the panel that still need to be fully addressed. 
Items such as non-compliance to the BCA report, including fire safety, um, um, access um, abilities, and general materials being used remain pending, and I believe will be coloured uh, covered by another speaker shortly, Justine and Joe, if he's still available. Um, we strongly believe that the report prepared by the council assessor has not addressed all the objections and that due diligence has not occurred on this occasion. With what we consider a very questionable and debatable recommendation to approve being presented to this panel by that council's paper. The DA has generated significant anxiety and concerns for all our residents and owners. Um, in addition, we consider the applicant has not always supplied accurate and complete documentation, and we have a sense that there has been a consideration on the, there has been no consideration on the lifestyle and visual impact on neighbours by this developer. We seek the panel support and our recommendation to decline this development application. Thank you for the time. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Any questions? Um, I've yes. got a, a question. The the atrium, with, and you've supplied some good photograph there. There are windows that look out onto that atrium, and I presume those are bedroom windows. Um, I can't see the extent of the atrium. It, it's tiled or decked or something like that. Is it a common area that people can use, or is it just a, a, a nice space in terms of light and ventilation for those bedrooms? No, it's a significant atrium. And this is a one of the incorrect of the drawings that's applied, an atrium that reaches virtually right across our building um, and goes right to the top. So um, it is significant. So anyone entering their apartment on any level will use the atrium. Um, but, it, but not in the sense of having sliding doors out onto it and using it as an outdoor area. It's, it's, it's as uh, a, a light well and a ventilation access. well. So um, and, and an access. So yes. all our... Um, apartment doors open onto the atrium. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. A couple of them are hidden behind, but a large majority of them actually open up into that atrium area. So the the apartment, it's not the front door of the apartment, it's a door opens onto the atrium. And yeah, yeah, our front door. Yeah, our front door to the apartment, so the, the vast right. majority of them. So right. this, this is poorly represented in those drawings. They've looked right. over not to include our atrium. Blocked it out in some cases. Very disappointing. Yeah, and I'm, I have looked at the site, and I'm, I specifically looked at the gates um, because of the um, submissions that have been put in. Um, and so, that, those, how long ago were those put in? Um, it'd be a couple of years ago, but it was after this building was um, commissioned. Um, there's nothing in our bylaws permitting it. Um, nothing and, whatsoever. And they didn't ask for permission. They didn't come and talk to the body corporate, as far as you know. No, I've been on the body corporate since day one. Never approached. Right. And have you talked to them about it and raised it with? No, them? we've gone through the council, and the council have responded a couple of times, saying it's um, it's not on our property. It's actually on three one seven, which is incorrect. Right, because I, I mean the gate clearly extends under the undercroft of your building. The one I'm talking yep. about, the one at the the, the rear lane. Yep. yep, very frustrating. Right. Have they talked to you, the the um, neighbours, in terms of the wall that's going to face onto the atrium, what finish that might nope. be? Colour? No, no, complete science. Um, we didn't have an, any idea. It was only that the council declined their first DA that we became aware of it. Right. And in terms of maintenance of the panels, you said you've had to maintain a couple of the panels. What, what did that entail? What did you have to do? One entailed that there was waterproofing issue. There was leaking getting into um, the building um, through one of the panels. Another one was one of the uh, panels was starting to vibrate in heavy winds and needed to be um, re-secured. Right. So these are lightweight panels that are attached to some sort of framework behind the panel. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, I wouldn't say that they're lightweight, but they are. Well, they're lighter, so. they're lighter than brickwork. Right? <laughs> yes, you know, yes, they like definitely that. are. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't and want to they, carry one around, but yeah. Yeah, and they extend, it looks like, from floor to floor, so to between a concrete slab and a concrete slab, and it looks like the panels are in between, and then there are flashings at the top of the panels and at the bottom of the panels. Is, is that what's happening there? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, pretty good. I think the picture hopefully demonstrates. I think I'm not sure whether some of them extend across 
more than one well, level. I'm thinking but I think specifically of the of the laneway next to the Masonic yes, Court, where you yeah. can see the what looks like the the edge of the uh, the concrete slab, even if it's been mm. covered, um, and it would look as if there are flashings there, and it would also look from the drawings as if this um, addition to the Masonic Hall extends um, sort of uh, to the a midway level on one of the panels, so it doesn't line up with a floor of flashings. No, right? no. The, the other thing that Wasser didn't put it in uh, a topic there. It's really unclear um, exactly how far up the um, extension will actually impede onto that atrium. Whilst they've given us a, a figure, I don't have any confidence in the drawings that su they've supplied is really reflective of the impact to the height to our building. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I saw when I was there, there was a... Um, a large garbage um, mm. uh, bin on wheels is. Does that belong to to East Lane? Nope. So that's been uh, raised with council as well. That's on our property. The um, the architect responded back in January to both made a clear statement. Both the bin and the gates are on the property of three one seven, which we consider are false. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, what was the re the response was from the applicant's architect? Who yes, that's right, yeah, so, in writing to the council, yes. Oh, okay, so there was a query from the council to the applicant and the response, you, you disagree with the response, you say that it was it's inaccurate. Yeah, yeah, they're saying it's on their property and it's definitely not. Um, the bin could be easily resolved through open communication or placing it on there, but um, they've chose not to enter in any... So you've tried to that. talk to the developer or you've only talked to council? I only talked to council because of um, general concerns, um, the approachability of this developer, but I don't want to talk about that in this form. No, no, okay, but it, it has only been council. Right? Yep. Mm, yep. Okay, that was all I had. Um, yep. Could I just ask, um, the panelling along the side of the building, are you aware, is, is that battened off a fire rated masonry wall or something or is it to framing i don't i don't know how the that side wall is constructed to you uh, no i'm not an engineer nor am i um it would be somewhere in the, the original development plans but uh, um i know it's all fire rated and all those type of things the questions that we've had to, had to be signed off but i can't talk to it in detail i'm but... sorry to go back to the bins <laughs> who, uses, <laughs> who uses the bins uh, 317 Pacific okay. Highway, the, uh, um, the applicant. Okay. Yeah, the applicant. And oh, just one last thing. You said something about maybe this was in the report and I missed it. Sorry. Uh, Neighbours approval not required. Yeah, so they, they, wrote in, yeah, they wrote in one of the responses when originally I think they put the original approach up that it was going to be uh, hard against our wall and flashing was required, and they responded by, we've now altered this, um, we'll no longer be using flashing, and it'll be, I think, 20 millimetres from the wall, and therefore no neighbour consent is required. Now, I don't believe that that's the applicant's um, decision to make that call, but I, I'm not a, uh, a council developer or a planner, so it's, it seems... Um, so you're saying the proposal stops 20 millimetres short? That's what I've been last, the last bit I could read, but it's unclear. It's not really well, contained can, in the yeah, council's ask, report. Yeah, we can ask the applicant's um, planner some of these yep. questions. I think. Thank you. Yep. Is there anything else? No, I don't have any more yep. questions. Lloyd? Yes, I, I, I take it that you're totally opposed what's been put forward, um, would you accept a compromise in terms of the length of the development or is it all or nothing as far as you're? Well, I would have a personal view, but I can't speak on behalf of the body corporate. Um, that would have to go in front of probably, that would have to go in front of an a extraordinary general meeting to have that discussed. I don't think they'd be very sympathetic given their feelings towards how this developer has approached 
um, working with their neighbour. Um, the alterations would have to be significant to ensure that there is no visual solar um, impact for us. Thank you. Okay, then thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our next speaker. And we have, um, I think, as you said, most well, a number of these people have made a written submission and or are observing. Joe Stanton, I can see you there, so I'll ask you to address the panel. Try to ring Joe. Sorry, I can't, but yeah. Joe, Joe, you can take yourself off mute. Um, I have to unmute. Yes, that's better, Joe. I can't hear you still. Volume. Oh, yeah. Still on mute. Still on mute. You might have to turn up his volume or something. Turn off your. That's it. Speak now. Now we can't hear you. You can't hear. No, we might um, get you to phone through to us. Um, or Peter, can you phone him, please? Okay. Still can't hear. No. I can't nope. call him, but he's on his mobile, so. You're on your mobile, so if you could hang up and then we will ring you. Thank you. Uh, while in the meantime, we'll go on to um, Justine Butler. Thank you, Justine. Hello. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Do you mind if I just share some images? Um, I to Yes, very, oh, are, they, are they not matters that we've seen? We've read all the documentation. Um, it would, it, they're just a few um, images to explain uh, very quickly my position. Okay, then, right here, just bearing in mind that we are uh, running behind time, but I certainly won't cut you short. Very well, share them. Okay, it shouldn't take any longer. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just quickly show you some of these matters. Just um, so uh, basically, I'm a neighbour. Um, I'm watching with interest DAs in this particularly densely built up area. Just every piece of space is, is filling up. Um, I'm an architect of a 25 years experience and design manager and project manager as well. And I am watching keenly and going through these drawings and seeing how are they achieving that? How's it being resolved? And do we understand the implications? Um, aside from the fact that I'm not a great fan of it aesthetically and many others aren't, this addition and, and the way it's been resolved. But um, this shows the decorative side wall panelling, um, which and the whole side wall encroaches 75 mil into that laneway and there is an easement for encroachment and there was financial compensation for that easement. Um, so the in the proposed condition, we're going to have a covered space with, as people have noted, potentially bins or who knows other materials stored there yes it's gated you know there's air under but we are now have a covered space um, uh, just to speak to that this is a plan showing that courtyard which I, I looked at these units I was interested in buying one at the time and yes all the front doors open onto this um, and you can see the blue color of the courtyard it looks directly out into that laneway and I'm just aware that the proposal cannot build within that easement for encroachment. So the wall, the wall has to sit 75 mils from the boundary because there's solid wall or panelling in that space. Um, and I'm concerned that, that they've shown steel columns on the boundary, right on the boundary. This, ha this is type B construction, but it needs a two-hour, two-way fire rated wall on the boundary. And that can't be achieved through unprotected steel. Yes, the BCA report and the reports say they will be fire rated, but that has a spatial implication. And I don't know of a way, looking at these drawings, to achieve a two hour two way fire rate, uh, sorry, two hour two way fire rated wall when what is being depicted is a stud frame with a bit of plasterboard on it. Knowing that that is exposed and also needs to be independently weatherproofed. Um, it's an external wall to the to the face of the neighbouring lot. So I can't see how else that will be achieved other than a masonry cavity wall, which would take up about 300 mil of space and have to sit 75 mil back from the face of the building. So this is just not 
we just can't see what the, is being proposed here. And it's, you know, understand that BCA reports need to be developed, but more is required to understand the spatial implications because I think they'll end up with what was a 2700 wide laneway will be reduced if it were to be a compliance emission to a 2300 wide. It's then not, it's too tight for vehicular access as it's been talked about in this report. Um, we really need to, a better resolved scheme uh, and it just doesn't comply as is. Um, we are concerned also and trying to, to look at how this has been addressed. Excuse me, I'm just trying to find the right slide here. With the fact that I'm aware that the, there's a DDA access to premises standard and it requires PWD entry and access through to the new part from the front entry. And what we're being told through this submission and what we can see is that there is a front entry. Yes, they will be doing alterations to the door. And if you can't access the building through the steps, you have a very convoluted pathway if the gates are open, uh, round the laneway down the back, past a car lift through a narrow space and into what we are not sure is a DDA accessible lift. There'll be need to be changes to those doors, I'm assuming. And for uh, accessible toilets, there isn't one provided in the building. Apparently there's one, oh sorry, there's the red circle there in the neighbouring lot. So I'm not sure how that works. If the compliance can't really be achieved by providing a facility on a, on a neighbouring lot, whether it's owned by the developer currently now or lots. So there's just, other than that, general concerns about the the impact on the, on the neighbours, the impact on all of us on the use of this laneway and the, and the look from all directions um, of this proposed addition, it, it just isn't resolved and I don't think can be as drawn. Um, and I also seek for it to be declined. Thank you, Justine. Um, we will now, we, nobody has any questions, so we'll move through to, um, I'll just call those people again. Joe Stanton, have we got him there? Thank you, Joe. Can't hear you still. Yep. Sorry, we can't hear you. Mm -hmm. No, we can't hear you. I'm very sorry. So you'll have to, can you go out and come back in again or just come in on your telephone and turn your video off? Can you hear me now? It's going to come back again. All right. Okay. Um, do we have any other uh, submitters who are on the line that would like to address the panel? Very well. Um, we'll just wait one moment for Joe Stanton. Is he back on, Peter? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Right here. We'll, we'll now move to James Lovell, who is the planner representing the applicant. And James, you might like to respond to some of the concerns that you've heard if you are in the position to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll do the best that I can. I'm at the disadvantage of uh, not having seen the late submissions to the panel and not having the engineer or the architect with me, but I'll proceed and do the best that I can to address the issues that were raised. But I could perhaps just give some brief background to the purpose of this application. So basically, I think it's fair to say that this is an outstanding example of the adaptive reuse of a heritage item. It's an important heritage item. I've been involved in this project for probably 15 years since it was first um, conceived of and it's progressed over a long period of time. And I think it's fair to say that, that it really is a genuinely good example of the adaptive reuse of a heritage item. The property um, has been approved for use as a, um, a gallery, an art gallery, and there's three basic purposes to the current application. The first is to slightly increase the display area at the first floor level of the building. 
Um, the second is to try to reclaim some of the internal light to the building that was lost when the site to the north was developed. And obviously that building's a lot taller than the, the um, Masonic building. So there was light lost to the building and it's important for the viewing of the artwork within the gallery that there'd be good natural light or as good as possible natural light retained in that building. And then the third purpose of the application was to enable a sculpture to be displayed in the front section of the glass so that it could be seen um, potentially from the Pacific Highway because, again, the, the heritage constraints of the existing building have limited the ability to provide any significant ad advertising. So this was conceived of as, a, um, as quite an effective means to make the use of the building was and to encourage people to come and look more closely at the artwork that was in, on display within that. So that's the basic purpose of it. Um, I think in terms of trying as best as I can to respond to the issues raised, I think the first one was the issue to in the, oh. some access points. Now, I I'm, I'm Just what, hang on, just hang, hang on one moment, James. We've got a lot of um, interference. Trying to call in. Oh, someone's trying to call in, Joe. Could you just hold it for oh. one moment? James, and we'll see whether Joe is going to talk to us. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. Thank you, Joe. Would you like me to talk now? Yes, I would. Thank you. Okay, look, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Joe Stanton. I am a unit holder of Crossroad at 1A Eden Street, and I'm also a business operator over 10 years in Eden Street, so I'm extremely familiar with the area of the street. Um, yes, I do object to development. First, I'd like to make some just two generic comments with regards to the streetscape of that uh, development. I guess it's only a matter of opinion, but it isn't a very unusual structure and it doesn't really enhance the streetscape. And I fail to understand how it's, uh, very, how it's sympathetic to the heritage building. Uh, so that's just a generic comment that perhaps the council, uh, the panel can take into consideration. Uh, another aspect I'd like to speak about is just the Fire integrity. I did mention I'm an insurance broker of over 40 years. We rate buildings based on their um, construction. By definition, this development is what is termed a inferior construction. Uh, hence, on that basis, it, it does it does to a certain degree does um, uh, have a, an impact on the fire integrity of the two adjacent buildings. To what degree, I can't tell you, but I can tell you the fact is it does have it does compromise the fire integrity of those two buildings. That's, that's a matter of fact, and it's something that should be considered. The other aspect of the um, objection is I do like to make the council aware of a um, court case of Kevin Cox versus the state of Queensland with respect to discrimination based on uh, uh, disability. Uh, it is a very, very important landmark decision, the one that you should be aware of, it is a case where a disabled person uh, complain about an affront access to the uh, to the Brisbane Convention Centre. I will quote what the tribunal found, as it's critically important in this matter. Uh, I quote: "The failure to provide access to the front entrance of a centre for persons with mobility impairment is unlawful discrimination." I do repeat: it is unlawful discrimination. It is in it is a direct discrimination on the ground of impairment in the provision of services and the administration of the state laws and programs to which no exemption applies. So it's very, very important that the panel is aware that uh, having no front entrance to uh, uh, persons with uh, mobile impairment is uh, unlawful discrimination. So I don't know if you're aware of that, but you should uh, make, uh, uh, you, you have, it's public knowledge, uh, Kevin Cox versus the state of Queensland, 24th of August, 1994, some public record. You should make yourself aware of that. That is a significant landmark decision. On that basis, that's my that I I do own a, an apartment right opposite that uh, development, and of course there is some impact to my apartment with regards to uh, uh, light uh, and um, yeah, with regards to really uh, shadow and lighting, etc. But however, the two main points of fire integrity and the basis of uh, um, uh, mobility discrimination is my my objection to this development. Thank you very much. 
Now, we're going to return to James Lovell, um, and you were advising us that... Um, uh, just continue on, James. Thank you. Well, look, perhaps just in response to those two issues that were that more recent submission, I think it was described as an inferior structure. I don't know what criteria that submission is referring to. Um, uh, and I think you've, there was reference made to the insurance industry. In terms of planning and architecture, it's, it's a very high quality structure. It's, it's, it's it stood the test of time. It's a heritage listed building and it's been very well adaptively reused. And I, I'm not sure what that basis of that criticism is. In terms of the second issue of disability, this is an application that's not changing the use of the building, which has been approved. And it's not, what it's doing is adding a section of floor space at the first floor level, the three purposes of which I described at the beginning of my comments. Um, irrespective, the application is accompanied by a disability access report. Um, and leading on to the other issues, it's accompanied by a BCA report, it's accompanied by a traffic and parking assessment report. So those reports were prepared during the consultation and the normal liaison with council staff during the assessment process. Um, obviously, it's culminated in a recommendation for approval, which the applicant is pleased to see. The applicant is also pleased with all of the conditions, with one exception, which I'll perhaps go to at the, at the conclusion. Um, so, I think going back to some of the submissions that were made earlier, um, there was an issue of bins and gates. Now, I'm not sure I haven't been to the property for some time um, and I don't know what the issue is, but they, it has to be resolved and it's independent of this DA because that's not an issue that arises as a consequence of this DA. So if there's something that's out of order or not being done correctly, it's unrelated to this DA, but it needs to be addressed notwithstanding. Um, so I think in terms of the overshadowing issue, I think um, I'm a little bit confused. And again, I'm at the disadvantage of not having seen the material that was submitted late to the panel. But as I understand it, concerns raised by the adjoining property to the north. And obviously the building's not going to have any impact on this um, solar access to that property. Um, I think if the concern is that the structure is adjacent to the atrium or a portion of the atrium, I think it's reasonable to conclude or re reference the fact that in this locality, the controls require a zero lot boundary setback to side boundaries. And this is a side boundary. What this applicant is trying to do is to reclaim some of the light to the building that was lost as a consequence of the adjoining building to the north being built um, directly up to. And as I now understand, I think it was said it was 75 mils over the boundary and that that's accommodated by an easement. In terms of the structure, if that's the structure and there's an easement in place, then it will need to accommodate that. And that's something that's built into the application and which presumably was um, considered by council staff and resulted in the recommendation for approval. Um, it has to be compliant with the BCA and, it, and those that material um, was submitted with the application and, it, and it has satisfied the council staff to the extent that it's recommended for approval. So the only final comment I might make is in regards... Steph, just, just one question on that, James. Did, are you aware that there is a 75 millimetre easement that was compensation what? that was paid? What? I wasn't aware, but I wouldn't have expected to be aware because I haven't been involved on this property for six months. No, I know, um, but in, ter in terms of the title uh, on the land, it would no doubt be shown up in a property search. I'm not aware of that. I took that at face value. I'm not aware of it. I, I okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so condition C1 of the recommendation um, is in reference to the glazed window on the eastern side of the extension, which is adjacent to the rear lane. And the condition requires that window to be removed. Um, as I said at the beginning, one of the main purposes of this application is to try to maximise light penetration into the building to improve the ability to view the artwork. And the purpose of the council removing that window is to mitigate the potential overlooking from that window towards the east and the apartments um, on Eden Lane. So what the applicant's asking that as an alternative to removing that window, that the window be retained, but that obscure um, finish be applied to the at least 1.6 or 1.7 above the internal floor level of the, um, the gallery. 
So the net effect of that is it will mitigate the potential overlooking in the same way, but it will allow the applicant to get some of that light through the window, which is, as I said, an important purpose of the application. Otherwise, the applicant's happy with the conditions that are recommended. Okay, I'll share. Uh, well, I'll see whether the panel have some questions. Um, Ra Randall? Brendan. Brendan, sorry. Brendan Randall. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it is a pity that the architect's not here because the questions were going to be detailed because there are practical uh, um, concerns that have been raised. Um, in terms of the construction of the wall and how it actually meets the other wall, but one of the um, one of the uh, objectors raised the comments that because it's twenty meters off the wall, it won't it isn't required to be there wasn't required to be some kind of notification. Do you know anything about that? I don't know what he was referring to. Twenty millimeters off that. Well, yeah, apparently a, there was some kind of gap um, provided. I, I, other than to say, the DA was notified, and the people that surround the property are aware of the DA. So that's, I'm not sure what the lack of notification was, and I'm not sure what that reference was. Well, I ask you because I'm looking at the documentation. I can't see any rec any gap shown on the drawings. In fact, it looks as though it's right up against the wall. But then yeah. that does ask the question, uh, how does it cope with all the ins and outs? And how would it cope with uh, the maintenance of the side of the apartment building? That, I think that was quite a big um, issue that was raised. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that wall effectively becomes a party wall because it's over the boundary, as I understand. But had it been on the boundary, it effectively becomes a party wall in the same way that the northern wall of this building becomes. So... Um, that's the way, that's my understanding of the situation. If in fact there's needs whereby that um, wall is over the boundary by the 75 millimetres, then I would expect, and assuming that that's correct, that the structure, the new structure, has to abut the edge of the easement and it can't go affect the portion of the site which is burdened by that easement. Uh, hence, the, hence the detailed nature of the questions. It just looks as though it's hard to do. There's another drawing here that says there's a... There's a flashing to the roof and it's just glued to the adjoining wall. And I just wonder how you can do that. Well, look, I, unfortunately, as I said at the beginning, I'm not the person that can answer that question. All I can say is um, the application was accompanied by all of the material that the council asked for. It was then carefully assessed by the council staff and they recommended approval of it. Now, they've also imposed a multitude of conditions which the applicant is happy with subject to the comments I made earlier. So in terms of okay. the construction, I'm not the architect and I'm not Thank the engineer. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you another question. Um, do you, can you, I'm, I'm just wondering how the, how the proposal can increase light to the internal space of the temple when it's, in fact... It's got a series of skylights on the roof of the extension and the, it's also got openings at the eastern and western ends of the glass enclosure. And as I, that was one of the reasons I was referencing the concern about enclosing the eastern end. So they've lost light as a consequence of the building, which is it's an approved building. I don't have an, there's no issue about that. But the, the effect of that and the height of that building and the proximity of the boundary is that the light that would otherwise penetrate the building and, and improve its use as a gallery has been affected. And this is a um, clever solution that the applicant has come up with in consultation with their heritage consultant to try to reclaim some of that natural light or as best as possible. Get so is light. this trying to get light to upstairs? Because it would appear as though it decreases light to downstairs. It's to get it upstairs. It doesn't decrease downstairs because there's not really any openings along there and any openings that are below this structure are already overshadowed by the adjoining building to the north. So it's mainly to try to get light into the upper level of the building. It's not penetrating internally into the building significantly because from a heritage perspective, there's a need to retain the integrity of those walls and the openings, but it's providing a space 
which has better natural light than the balance of the gallery and that allows for the viewing of some items and exhibits. Okay. Do you think it's an issue that the actual new component is stepped, so therefore it's not accessible? Um, no. Well, for two reasons. Firstly, it's, that's not part of this DA and the reason it's stepped is because it's trying to accommodate the change in floor levels of the existing building and to remain lower at the front of the site. So that was something that was discussed with the applicant's heritage consultant and the council's heritage advisor. So the step in the building is already there at, at the levels below. Um, the main exhibit space, exhibition space is flat, but this is not an application that's changing access to the building or changing access to bathrooms or changing the use of the building and it was accompanied by a, an access report that was done to the satisfaction of council staff i think i think i think the steps uh yeah i'm really trying to understand the steps oh i see what you mean so the concern initially expressed by council and not just council the applicants consultant was that it was important that the extension of the building remained subservient and different to the prominence of the front facade, which include the large columns. So it's set back behind the columns and it's lower at the front of the building so that it's more clearly subservient to the prominent front facade of the Masonic Hall building. So that's introduced a level change, um, but it's that's really the area that's intended to accommodate the sculpture that hopefully will be visible from the West, it's not really intended to form part of the exhibition space, which better functions as a flat space. And therefore, the remainder of the addition is at the same level as the upper floor plan and the upper exhibition space. So that, that level change is twofold. Firstly, to address the heritage issue, and secondly, um, to accommodate the sculpture without the need to for, for it to form part of the exhibition space. Can I just interrupt? I think the panel might be on mute. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lovell, I was just going to ask you, do you have any comments referring to the impact on the uh, apartments at the rear of the, at the east, um, in, the, in the lane itself that face the proposal? Um, well, the impact is very minor, I, I think. I mean, the impact is essentially limited to the rear portion of the addition that is compliant with the side boundary setback control of zero in this locality. It's well below the height control that applies. It's below the upper level of the, or the eave level of the Masonic Hall building. Um, the one concern with respect to privacy was sought to be addressed by a condition that required the deletion of that window. And as I said earlier, the applicant doesn't have a concern about needing to mitigate the overlooking, um, but would prefer that that be done with obscure glazing rather than removing the glazing. So I'm familiar with that property. I was involved in the court case when that was originally approved. I haven't been there for a long time, but beyond those impacts that I've identified, I, I'm not sure what the significant issue would be. Can I, I'll just ask, building mm. separation, um, breeze. Well, the building separation is no different to what the separation is now. It's slightly larger because of the oblique angle at which these buildings relate to each other. So the addition of, to the Masonic Hall building adopts the same alignment as the rear of the Masonic Hall building. The adjoining buildings to the rear are at an obscure angle. So relatively, the, the distance or the separation distances are slightly greater. Um, but the important point in terms of separation distances is primarily in, in, a, in the case of a very built up area like this is to ensure that you don't have direct or significant overlooking. Um, and that's the matter that I dealt with in respect to condition C1. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Lovell, um, 
I understand that this addition to the exhibition space is approximately 70 square metres. Uh, do you know how much space currently exists within the building? Uh, from memory, it's somewhere in the order of 500 square metres of floor space. It's referenced in the council report because there's a control that requires a minimum area of non residential floor space, which it complies with. My recollection is the total floor area is in the order of 520 square metres. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple Meredith? of questions. I'm not sure if I understood you um, before, um, James, when you said that one of the things you're trying to achieve with this extension is actually to bring more light into the building and, and by actually... Is, is, am I understanding that that's what, what you were saying? Well, 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 the main, well, the building's outstanding from my perspective as a gallery, but one of the concerns of the operator and owner of the gallery was that there was, and is, very limited light coming into the floor space. And there's a limitation on what can be done about that because you can't make significant penetrations in the northern wall of the building because it's a heritage listed building. Um, so one opportunity was to introduce a space along the northern side of the building that had skylights and glazing to the east and west, which could provide some light into the building. And some of the um, displays and exhibitions benefit from having light internally to the building rather than the uh, artificial light that's available through the balance of the building. Should also say, along the same lines, but in, to a different extent. It's also proposed to reinstate eight windows on the southern facade of the building that had been bricked up. And again, the purpose of that is to try to get as much light as possible. Now it's on the southern side of the building, but it is generally to get as much light into the building because some exhibitions and displays are better seen with natural light than they are in artificial lighting. And this is a small space, but it can be important space to some items in exhibition. Right. So the idea would be to have a smaller space with which is better lit by the skylights, because obviously it's not going to bring more light into the rest of the building. It, you know, Unfortunately, it can't, no, because there's a limitation on penetrating the building, irrespective yeah. of this extension. But there is a spot or under this scheme, there is a space that will be available that will have skylights, will have blazing at the western end and hopefully at the eastern end. And therefore, it provides an alternate space which benefits some displays and some items that are better seen without artificial lighting. And, and at the same time, add the opportunity for the sculpture at the front. And just coming to the sculpture at, at the front, you've been involved with this building for a number of years. Um, would you have been involved at the, uh, the time the, the building to the north was approved? Yes, and I objected to it on behalf of the applicant of the owner of number 317. Right. You might, uh, when you look at numbers, sorry, I should just say that adjoining to the building to the north includes a cutout section in the southwestern corner of that building at the upper levels. And one of the, well, I think the main purpose of that was to try to retain some of the prominence of the facade of the Masonic Hall building. Because as, the, as you come around that corner, unfortunately, the adjoining building to the north obstructs most of the views of the building. Um, the cutout is partially successful, but it's not fully successful. But yes, I was involved and the same issue arose then. And at the time, there was always a concern that that building was built to the boundary and to its height control. And the consequence was that it was going to limit the visibility of the Masonic Hall building, but also the potential to get light into the building. But was an approved development and it's a compliant development. It's just that competing interests of a heritage item against compliant control. Yes, coming coming back to competing um, uh, elements there, you talk about the cutout in the building to the north, and I think it is actually successful to some extent um, in that you can see the 3D, um, yeah, the, the sculptural element of the Masonic Hall. Now, if the um, the new window actually comes, the, the glass will actually be in the same plane as the brickwork of the front facade of the Masonic Hall. So, in fact, it will obscure what the that cutout was designed. And, and from what you're saying, you're involved in, a, in an objection to achieve that cutout. Um, and then the new extension will actually obscure that. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. So the the 
the glass cutout is it or the cutout of the adjoining building at the north is at the upper two levels and the purpose of that was to try to retain some views of the upper portion of the columns and the and the roof above the columns at the front of the building the proposed but but as you come down um, the Pacific Highway, the lower two portions of the building obstruct large parts of the Masonic Hall building. The glass enclosure that we're talking about here now is set at the first floor level and it's set at the alignment of the brickwork of the Masonic Hall building, which is already behind the alignment of the adjoining building to the north. It was set on the alignment of the brickwork so that it didn't um, complicate the facade relative to the more Dominant, uh, prominent columns on the front elevation. So it remains behind the alignment of the adjoining building to the north. It's on the alignment of the brickwork of the face of the Masonic Hall building, but it's behind the more prominent and more important columns on that front elevation. So it's not obscuring anything that's that wasn't protected by having it set back to the brick line. Thank because you. We, we retain the views of the column. I just have a couple of questions, James. Um, I was just looking at, in terms of the light, it's really just light then to this um, alleyway exhibition, I'll call it, as opposed to the upper, uh, the upper floor. And um, could you achieve light into the upper floor for the purposes of exhibition with, you know, some appropriate skylights? Uh, you, you possibly, but the... The, the ceiling of the Masonic Hall is extremely important and I don't think it can be damaged. It had to be rebuilt when it was burned. It's very decorative. Um, it's very expensive and it's important from a heritage perspective, albeit it's been replaced, but it's very important. And that's the main restriction to putting skylights into the building. Plus you don't have openings at the eastern and western ends of the upper level again for heritage reasons. Mm. Um, so and and light that you might get to a, an area that large is less important than an area where you might be able to concentrate some natural light for those displays that benefit from it. Okay, just one other question. Um, I mean, there, it is there is a you know a slight intensification here. Um, I'm just. Curious about the servicing ability, you know, storage of bins, bringing in art exhibits, whatever, given that back lane situation. I was just wondering how how, how the building is serviced. Yeah, so firstly, nothing's changing in terms of the servicing the building. So the way that I understand it works is that exhibitions run for a certain period of time and then they, they're changed. So... There's not a large and regular turnover of displays, so but you might have. Just, just forgive me, but where do you actually bring in the new exhibits, etc., and take out the? Um, yeah, the so they're brought in by vans, and they come in the rear lane, and then move out through the Pacific Highway as an exit point. But there's not a large turnover of displays, so an exhibition. So, 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 sorry, when you say they exit onto the Pacific Highway through the through the setback area there or th back through the laneways? No, through the, the approved driveway, which is the driveway that extends along the northern boundary of the site. So the that, that, the that, laneway, that, the, yep. Well, it's, it's not really a laneway. No, it's no, a, it's, it's, it's a setback area, yep. Yeah, it's a driveway, yeah. Yeah, so that's the driveway. That's So they use that. So this won't in, in, be an impediment to the delivery or um of of art installations no so it's designed with a 3.6 meter clearance height so that the vehicles bring the artwork at the beginning of this display or exhibition and remove it at the end can mm. underneath the the enclosure is, and they, they typically come in vans there is okay. no issue so so where where do you have your bin storage and all other sort of services that are required to run a business I can't remember, to be honest. Um, wherever they are supposed to be at the moment is where they have to be under this application because there's no change proposed to the waste management arrangements. I know there's a condition dealing with it, but it, it's it's not really relevant because they're not changing the waste management arrangement. It, does, it, it generates very little waste 
is another issue because most people don't purchase their artwork at the premises. They come and view the artwork at the premises and then purchase it separately. So that it generates very little waste, but there's no change to the approved waste management arrangements. If someone's putting a bin in the wrong spot, that has to be resolved, but it's unrelated to this application. Okay, well, that's why I was curious to know where it is within the facility. Yeah, I don't know. It's not changing from where it is supposed to be, though. That's what I do know because it's it's unrelated to this extension. I, I just don't know off the top of my head where the bins are stored. Okay, well, it would appear to be that they're stored in, within that laneway area adjacent to the um, building to the north. But anyway, okay. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's where they're collected from, but whether they're stored internally and then transferred to that space for collection purposes, I'm not sure. But so is it, is it a private collection? Uh, yes. I believe so. I should say I believe it is. I don't know that, sir, but that was always my understanding. Right, okay. Can I ask another question? Yep. yep. Um, I'm just just coming back to the um, facade of the building to the north that's on the on the boundary or encroaching over the, the boundary. Um, would would you accept that? Yeah, you, know, you really have to sort of accept the building as it is. I mean, that's what's there now. It's what's been approved. What's been built, and there needs to be allowance made to be able to maintain that. No, I mean, I think. In certain circumstances, that is the case, but they're borrowing from the property to the mm. south or the subject site. And in this locality and under these controls, there's a requirement that buildings are built to the boundary. So in ordinary circumstances, there would be back-to-back -back buildings built to the boundary in the same way that this extension partially does that. It's unrelated to what happens to the remainder of the building and its maintenance requirements, but if it's built to the boundary, and in fact, in this case, over the boundary, and in circumstances where the controls require buildings to be built to the boundary, it's a, a essentially becomes a party wall. And I don't think the neighbor to the south, the applicant in this instance, should um, have to provide additional accommodations for the maintenance of an adjoining building that's built to and over the boundary. It's, it's not a common situation. Uh, when you Can I just, said, sorry to interrupt, uh, I know that it's no, no, supposed no, to be no, quite, no, so. sorry, it's not a question and answer session. Uh, yeah. When, when um, you put in an objection um, in terms of uh, the building that was built to the north, did you object to the fact that they were putting in a rain screen type of facade there as opposed to for example, a masonry wall or a concrete wall, which could obviously be easily be built up to. No, my major concern with the adjoining development to the north was not what material they placed on the elevation. The major concern was the alignment and the height of the building and its impact on the significance and prominence of the Masonic Hall building. I don't think a building would have been deep. I don't even recall what materials were shown on that wall, but it's a it's a wall that's built to, and in this case, over the boundary. So that's what happens. It's clearly been built as a facade that uh, should be looked at. It's not built as a wall, which is going to have something built up against it. It's, it's the same materials as around the rest of the building. So it was obviously intended to be seen and possibly to be the backdrop that you would see the Masonic Hall up against as you're coming up the highway. Well, I don't know whether it was intended to be seen. I mean, it, maybe that was the case, but it doesn't change the fact that it's built to the boundary or it's slightly over. over. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, then. And just one final question then. Um, I think the heritage comments were that um, uh, it would be preferable to set back the new glass modernist structure further back. But in terms of what you're saying about the sculpture, I'm just trying to understand how that could be achieved. I think the heritage officer initially made two suggestions. One is that there be a curb treatment to the front glazing or alternatively that it be set further back. The council's planner considered those comments and <clears throat> so did the applicant's heritage consultant and said that the curb treatment would be a negative element because it's contrary to the form of the building and it 
plaques from the prominence of the facade. In terms of the alignment of it, it comes back to the issue of trying to make it visible and the fact that the building's been significantly obscured by the building to the north. And every inch you move this enclosure back is more obscured from the north. So it's important. And, and it was chosen on the alignment of the brickwork, which is behind the alignment of the columns. But if it moves any further back, it's severely compromised by the building to the north or further compromised. Okay, all right then. Well, I think we've um, heard enough on this matter and thank you all for your contributions today. We will be making a uh, decision this afternoon and our advice will be on the council's website. Uh, so thank you all for your contributions and that's the end of the public meeting, um, which now has been closed at um, 